Meteorologically, I suspect we'll have a beautiful day tomorrow. Theologically, I see that God is all-powerful and we are small indeed. So what does it tell you, Holmes? Watson, you idiot, it tells me that someone has stolen our tent. So, seeing is not so simple a matter. Today's gospel is about seeing and not seeing, sight and blindness. It's certainly one of the longest healing stories in the Bible, this story about the man born blind. He doesn't have any other name except man born blind. Jesus heals many people, but this story was told with excruciating detail and it is meant to teach. At the opening, Jesus is walking along. He sees this man, a human being lacking one of his basic senses ever since his birth. Unlike other healing stories, this man does not address Jesus, does not make a request. Of course, he could not see Jesus. Um, nor does Jesus speak to this man. Instead, it starts with the disciples who ask Jesus what I guess for them was the obvious why question about lifelong blindness. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, the association of disease, misfortune, or disability with sin, moral failure, was deeply rooted in scripture, although it seems rather cruel to us. We know a lot more about the sources of these problems. It was in those days sort of a blame the victim mentality. Jesus upends this understanding. He says that the blindness was not caused by sin, but that this is an opportunity for God's work to be revealed. God's healing, restoring, loving nature. And this alone is a huge teaching of this story. But as you heard, it goes on. As Jesus mixes up a batch of mud and plasters it on the blind man's eyes, Jesus also starts talking about blindness as a metaphor. And he says, I am the light of the world. I'm the light that allows the world to truly see, truly to see. The Pharisees then lodge a complaint because Jesus did this healing on the Sabbath day. You just can't win with the Pharisees. No good deed goes unpunished. They try to undermine Jesus' healing act. They question the identity of the healed man. They go and ask his parents what happened. They interrogate the healed man about Jesus. They call Jesus a sinner. But the man born blind simply says, all I know is I was blind and now I see. Isn't that enough? In our Tuesday Lenten study, the theologian Marcus Borg points out that blindness is a primary biblical image for what ails us in this life, what it is we need healing and salvation from. Blindness can be physical or spiritual or moral. My mother, at an elderly age, is now physically blind from macular degeneration. She loved to read all her life. It's easy to ask, why me? Why this? There is no good answer to those questions that I have found. But God does provide some alternative ways of seeing, even when our eyes don't work anymore. Then there is moral blindness, blindness to the rights and needs of other people. All the ways we walk by on the other side of the road when someone is troubled or suffering. Part of my own blindness is spiritual blindness to the, the 
deep feelings of other people. Like many guys in the world, I like to fix problems. When somebody tells me about a problem in their life, I start trying to think of solutions. Well, you could do this. Or, have you tried that? What my blindness keeps me from seeing is that people aren't always looking for me to solve their problems. Often, they really want me to listen, to really hear where they are and how they feel and what they fear and what they hope for. Like Watson, I'm busy describing the stars in the heavens, but the reality is on a different level. The immediate problem is that the tent is missing, that people feel vulnerable, they are in pain, suffering a loss, they need to be heard. At the end of the story, the Pharisees finally get Jesus' point. And they say, surely we are not blind, are we? Well, of course they are. We all are. The sooner we see that, see that, the better. When we acknowledge our blindness, then paradoxically we are on the road to real seeing. Seeing our world as others see it. Seeing the world even as God sees it. We'll see both the grandeur of the stars and, and the small details about the tent. We'll see from our own point of view and also begin to see the world from others' point of view. Eventually, with much practice and prayer, we'll get glimpses of the world from God's point of view. The world as God sees it. And that will be a sign of real healing of our blindness, whether it's physical, moral, or spiritual blindness. Perfect healing is probably not possible in this life, but that doesn't mean we stop praying or stop trying to see better, stop working toward a more Christ-like way of living. I hope our worship here at St. Dunstan's helps to shed light on our lives and our spirits helps to alleviate our blindness and bring us healing. As we continue our conversation about worship through Lent, I'd like to pose a question or two relating to the issues of healing. I hope you'll speak up now with your responses in the next three or four minutes. Main question is this, what would you think about adding a healing ministry to our Sunday service, probably in the form of offering the laying on of hands and anointing for healing to those who wish it after they receive communion. This could be done at a station in the back of the church. Uh, those of you who have been to our Wednesday noontime service are very familiar with this uh, sacrament. I'll come down from my perch so we can talk. Any thoughts? Okay. It would make it more accessible more people, for sure. How many of you have ever seen that rite performed? Quite a few. Any other thoughts on that? Good idea. Yes, for after people receive communion, if they wish, they could go back to a station appointed for this. And while communion is going on, uh, 
the healing rite would be administered. So it would not add uh, time to the service. It could be meaningful even for those who don't choose to receive it on any given Sunday to, w to witness the healing ministry in church. Any other comments? Uh -huh. That's a possibility. And the logistics we could work with. Oh, the question is: Would it would it be possible to do it uh, in front rather than in back? Say it one part of the uh, maybe one part of the altar rail or something would be appointed for it, perhaps. Those are things we would work out to maybe try it a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. That's another good question. The frequency, would it be every week or other week, every other week or what? No. We could offer two places and see what people chose. I like that. He's a problem solver. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Anne. Start twice a month and then, yeah, okay. All good ideas. Thank you so much. And now uh, we'll have a moment of quiet and then the, the creed. Has Let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, page 7. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
he will come again to glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Prayers of the people are found in your bulletin on page 8. God of earth and heaven, we offer to you our cares and concerns for the world you have made. We pray for the Church of Christ in all places. May it be a place of peace, reconciliation, and healing among your peoples. In the diocese, we pray for the canons and staff of the Diocese of Washington, all vestries and parish leaders and staff members. In the Anglican Communion, we pray for the Anglican Church of Pakistan, the Church and people of Haiti, the Church and people of Japan. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We pray for the nations and people of the world. Let your healing power come upon those places where war and violence terrorize our, your children. Strengthen the hand of all who work for freedom. Shatter the spears of all who oppress, especially in Libya. Bring to an end our wars in the Middle East. I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy shaft to comfort me. We pray for those in our own congregation who are sick, sorrowful, or in trouble. In need of healing, Barbara Larrabee, Jennifer Crawford, Jennifer Mooney, Susan Murphy, Anthony Cox, Jeffrey Cox, Tonis Mang, Edith Carden, Stephen Bush, Olivia Pierce, Steve Vermillion, William Harris, Ken Askey, Aston Wilson, Marie Walter, Marty Reagan, Robert Longstreet, Ronnie Faulkner, Janet Wright, Ruth and Bob Wendell, Kay Carroll, and Mary Jane Owen. Let your healing light shine upon them and bring peace. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. We pray for all who have departed this life. The USS deaths in Afghanistan from March 23rd through March 29th. Afrin Harajaga, Frank Adamski III, Jameson Lindstrog, Jeremy P. Faulkner, Dustin J. Feldhaus, Brian A. Burgess, Justin D. Ross. There were no deaths reported in Iraq during this period. We pray for all who serve our country and all of the men, women, and children whose names we do not know who have died in conflicts throughout